Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Love of Cars presented by Haggerty. And first up, a bit of an apology yesterday for our fans and viewers that were watching. Yes, we did not just lose internet, we lost the entire grid between Marina del Rey, where we are at the motoring club, all the way through to Venice. So it was a pretty unilateral block at blackout. And uh, right as we were getting to the heart of the matter, with one young Henry Ford III. So Henry is joining us again in a minute. I'm just waiting for him to tune back in. And then uh, Teague Moriarty, our chef, Michelin star chef from Sons and Daughters in San Francisco. He cannot join us this afternoon, but uh, hopefully we'll get him on a show in the next couple of weeks. And then to round up, we have our great friend Jay Ward from Pixar joining us to talk about cars and cars. Once again though, uh, Tommy isn't with me, and he's not with me to kick off the show. Uh, you know when someone's at a party, and they tell a joke, and no one hears it, so they tell it again, just because they want to be funny? He, wa he, he wants to, to do the chicken car thing again, but uh, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't start. So that is the electric chicken. Tommy, you are one of a kind. Oh my God, are you happy now? Does that feel, do you feel, yeah, there he is, the wave. Tell us, you know, this time, tell us a little bit about El Gallo. El Gallo, well, um, my wingman, literally and figuratively, uh, came into my life in 1997, which those that are the hardcore race fans will realize that was my dream season. But before that season started, during the off season, I had a chance encounter with this car um, tried to buy it from the person I flagged the girl down who was dry, tried to buy it from her. No luck. Couple twists of fate later. Auto Week ran a picture. They ran it again. I'm racing in Phoenix, winning. I think that was my second Trans Am win in a row. I get a call. Auto Week says that car you want is in an impound yard in Santa Monica. I beelined it home after the race and bought him for $895, towing and storage fees and it has been literally 25 years almost of, of fun and wild, unexpected meetings, experiences, and so forth. So, um, and I mean, I've fallen in love. I, I really hadn't noticed a 73 Olds 98 before that, but you know, it's got little things. The, the, uh, the climate controlled is called Comfortron. It's got a Tiffany clock. It's got plastic wrap on the seats um, from a grandma that owned this car before. So anyways, needless to say, uh, it's true love with me, but uh, oh. thanks for indulging me, you know, for making, you know, we're in showbiz, so sometimes yeah. you have to take three or four takes and have to totally. act like it's the first time. Totally, you know, and I'll just bring up my kids next time. <laughs> I mean, does that sort of like round it off equally? But Tommy did say something here at the Motoring Club. They also store some fabulous cars for the owners. You might have noticed that he wanted the red carpet yesterday where well, he did. He had a red carpet of Ferraris, but you said something interesting. You said, I think it's the most valuable car in here. Tell me why. Well, it's funny because I, I was uh, the, a guy named uh, Jim Williams, who used to be on the, the rear wing of all the Penske cars, Jay Williams cars. He built Irwindale Speedway. I took it to Irwindale one night. He says, Kendall, how much for the car? I said, million bucks, Jim. He's like, million bucks? I said, well, there's only one, and you can afford it. He goes, that's crazy. And so thinking about it later, I'm like, you know what? I'm at the point, I started going through in my head crazy, and I'm thinking, would I take, I wouldn't take a million bucks for it today. I wouldn't take 10 million bucks for it today. Wow. And then I'm like, how do you sell your best friend? So um, call me crazy. I'd, I'd yeah. probably have issues with the wife or s yeah. somewhere near that 10 million mark. But Well, I, I mean, just, just in case anyone's wondering, they're very beautiful. I'd sell both my children for five. <laughs> um, well, we have an amazing show on our hands. Uh, and thanks so much. For, sorry about the blackout. It, I literally didn't sleep well last night because take, we take the show very personally. Uh, but we're back here today. Let's kick it off with Henry Ford III. He is on the board of trustees for the Henry Ford Foundation. He is extremely philanthropic. He is definitely the, that has been brought up correctly within the family, as in he has worked in every single department, uh, I believe almost throughout the whole company, understanding marketing, understanding sales. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's really a very interesting and well-rounded chap. And we see him at all these great car events. It's just really exciting to be able to have him on the show. So let's try it again, calling in from a car. 
in Detroit. Are you there? <laughs> hey! Yeah, can you hear me okay? <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, you get an E for effort because yeah. we had our issues today. Not only do you indulge that, the power went out in your neighborhood because of a storm, and so you never say die. You're in your car in the driveway? It, yeah. <laughs> That's a, well, I had to drive down the street to get better cell reception, so I hope you guys Thank can you. hear me okay. So I presume you're in a Ford. What Ford are we in? Uh, I am in a uh, Ford Expedition, as a matter of fact. Okay, sweet. I, I thought it was 27 feet long inside, so I could see your your children <laughs> yeah. are at the your children can be at the back, and you can't hear them. How fantastic! Exactly, exactly. There's plenty of room. Oh, well, thanks for trying this again. You must have thought that we the interview wasn't going that well yesterday when suddenly we cut you off. <laughs> I did. I was a little concerned at first, but uh, I'm so I'm thankful to be back. Glad glad to get the second invitation. Oh, well. I mean, we talked about some stuff yesterday. We might might come back to that. But, you know, I think you were just starting to ask a question yesterday, Henry, which which is really the root of this whole show, Henry, which is we have chefs, we have designers, we have industrialists, we have race car drivers, legends. But it's all about and musicians. What is their what is their personal moment that they that they went? Wow, I'm I'm I love cars for me, obviously, as a racing driver's son, it was oh, wow, <laughs> isn't everyone's dad a race car driver? Uh, you know, and suddenly I realized it was something pretty cool, and that was the world I was brought up in. What was your moment? Do you remember it? When you at school or something, you went, wow. I do, yeah. So my, um, you know, my, my dad is is, uh, is very passionate about race car driving, and, and uh, so he kind of got all of us, uh, myself and my brothers, uh, even my mom, into it at a pretty young age. And uh, so my my first memories of really sort of um, seeing a, a car up close and personal and really being blown away by it was actually back in, so probably the early to mid 80s. Um, and I was born in 1980, so I was not very old at the time, probably four or five. And there used to be a Formula One race in Detroit uh from about 82 until 88 i think and my dad would bring us downtown for that race and uh so to be at a formula one race as a you know five-year-old probably was uh was a pretty incredible experience and um although i i have to say i don't think he took me to the actual race i think he took me to practice sessions and qualifying because yeah. i think he was a little concerned uh that that it might be too loud uh during the race but um you know, to see those cars up close and personal and just the, you know, the, the, the sounds and the smells and the whole like visceral experience of it all uh, just got me hooked. So I, th that was my earliest memory, I think, of being exposed to kind of cars and, and racing in particular. Yeah, total <laughs> sensory overload in that era. Uh, and so I, I had the same experience. My dad took me to the free practice day of the Long Beach Grand Prix. It was I'm older than you. So it was it was about 10 years earlier than that. And I was, I think, 10 at the time and uh and just remember all of a sudden like oh my god what is this and then nothing until he dabbled in it but um now you have an interesting experience because as a kid you don't know anything you don't know what ford motor company is really you, like his dad was a race car driver your dad and grandfather were in the car biz so now you have an appreciation for the the you know the 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 impact and so forth but as a young kid what was your recollection of of the Ford family or the family businesses or before you you had full awareness? Was it you know uh, always new cars coming home? What was that like as a little kid? Yeah, I would say the the so the, the fact that my dad did work at Ford Motor Company uh, did mean that he often would bring uh, sort of new cars home, and I think that was the most interesting part for me personally. And I remember um, the first car that he brought home that I was really blown away by was the uh, the Mercur XR4 Ti. And so this was probably this again was probably like I don't know late 80s maybe I should I should look this up. But um, I mean that car that car just like absolutely blew me away. It was just I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And the, the fact that my dad could bring that home for the weekend uh, was just was just amazing to me. Yeah, you know, and I I thought about that. From is what's great about I think all of us we have these yeah look at it we have these shared experiences <laughs> even though they're not the look at it <laughs> that is that is something special I gotta say um, <laughs> well but it was European based it was SVO yeah. I think it was SVO because there was an S, maybe there was an SVO Mustang that had the same biplane rear wing 
Um, yeah. Uh, it, isn't that so funny, though? You're so innocent, and you're like, it, it, it clearly was different than anything yeah. at the time. It didn't look like other cars. Yeah. And you, you know, now you, you have an appreciation, but yeah. it's just well, it's I remember innocent. when Dad, Dad bought home a, a TR7. Mm-hmm. Do you remember? It was like a, it was like a wedge shape yep. like this. Um, and to me, it was that. I mean, I just stood there staring at it. It was just the coolest. It was the coolest car that we didn't have for long. <laughs> <laughs> but it was kind of cool. No, I, you know, I, I did think about it, Henry, because in the in the most recent version of that for you, 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 I mean, we know what you're doing with you know the strategy of the company where it's going, which means I always feel sorry for some of the executives by the time they get, especially the marketing guys, by the time they get to the auto show, and they're excited, they have to be excited to tell us about the new car. They're already actually working on the next car, and this one is they've seen now for a couple of years however i bet the ford gt was different f- for everybody there because i had not it was i never saw one in the flesh in any way until i saw the race car and i just i i had that same childhood boyhood total jaw dropping moment I, I mean i saw the look on your face when you're around that car Tell us what that whole thing, going racing, seeing that car, seeing it develop. What was that like for you personally? Uh, it was, without a doubt, uh, one of the highlights of, of my career. Um, you know, I, I think to be a part of that program um, and just be a part of the history and um, going back to Le Mans. And from the, from the road car perspective, though, I remember being at the auto show, um, the Detroit auto show, where we unveiled it for the first time. And the day before the auto show opens to the press, uh, we, the Ford Motor Company brings in uh, a large group of employees and they show everything to the employees. And so I remember Bill and Mark Fields being on the stage and, and announcing to all the employees that they had this, you know, this big secret to show everybody and that they couldn't tell anybody, um, you know, because the car was, was, you know, had not been unveiled yet. And, um, you know, obviously many times when we unveil cars, you get spy shots that are leaked and that sort of thing happens. But with the Ford GT, uh, we had really worked hard to keep it under lock and key. And so uh, when the employees saw the car the day before the auto show and to be in the crowd and just to see the reaction and and to feel the energy from all the employees was really uh, just an amazing experience. And then no one took any pictures. No one leaked anything. So when it was revealed the next day to the press, um, again, the excitement was there for them. Um, but the racing program was really kind of a highlight to, to be able to go back to Le Mans and, uh, and repeat what we had done 50 years ago with, with my dad. Um, and he had been there 50 years ago with his dad. Uh, so to be a part of that kind of history and that legacy was, uh, it was really something special. It was something I'll never forget. Now you touched on it already basically, but it's sort of the answer to the question, you know, that era, not only was it the Ford GT, all the cars, the Ford Performance cars, were unveiled in that blue that year. You had the Ford GT, yeah. you had the second-gen Raptor, you had the GT350R, you had the uh, Focus RS. And, I mean, you want to talk about a lineup. They don't make up a huge part of the company's business. But much like Penske uses motorsports to imbue enthusiasm and loyalty and some of those things, you said the reaction amongst the employees was one of pride. How important is are those kinds of vehicles to – keeping people jazzed oh i mean so important you know and and um you know the our shelby mustangs uh you know really benefit the mustang brand and and vice versa and you know raptor does the same thing for f-150 and and focus rs did the same thing for focus and now we're seeing it um on explore st for explore and and edge st for edge and uh same across some of our european products as well so our performance brands um you know whether it's the ford gt or even the st brand um, you know, that, that kind of performance at really sort of, um, you know, an, an, an approachable price for many people, um, really brings out the, you know, the true driving people, the true driving personalities yeah. and the, the passion and the energy behind cars that we know so many of our customers have. And so it's absolutely a, a halo for our brand. And, um, it's exciting, really exciting whenever we get to introduce a new one. You can just, you can just see that the Ford aficionados, the Ford fans, uh, I mean, every car manufacturer seems to have their ingrained camp, right? I mean, you go to you, you, the, the corrals that you had at the races. It was just fantastic. The owners swapping people that used to come up to us as, you know, we know within racing who and the race fans who had ordered a Ford GT who hadn't got it yet. 
they would tell you everything about it. This is a year out. You know, I mean, it was like it was like the, the they were the birth of their child, and they had the scan, and they know what sex it's going to be, and they know they know everything about it. It was, it was a, is someone walking by thinking you're doing something wrong in the car? You're about to get arrested. Yeah, yeah. they're one, they're wondering why I'm sitting in my car talking on the phone. <laughs> I just saw you looking nervously out the window. Hello, excuse me. Who do you think you are? Um, no, you're actually right. And 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 you know, to be honest, when when we were at Le Mans in 2016, I was so nervous because we had so many Ford GT owners with us at that race. And, you know, you've only got one shot to repeat history 50 years in the making. And, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, the, my biggest fear was that we were going to let down all these people who traveled, you know, all over the world to be at Le Mans with us. And uh, thankfully we didn't. But but no, I mean, the that kind of passion and energy uh, really, I think, drives a lot of what we do. Yeah. I, you know, I drove the yellow one off your stand. Do you remember it was outside yeah. the Ford Pavilion? Yeah. And so I took that car for a drive up around the, the roads. They were letting certain media do it, and, and um, it had no place in the show I was doing at the time for, for, for Fox Sports. But it was, I, I managed to convince someone that it did. And so I, I, took a, I had my camera, and I did it. And, but it was, it was on a little French country road. You were using, you know, I was using like 11% of its performance, but it felt, it honestly, it felt like I was riding a, a you know, a Ducati monster around my, around my kitchen. It was ready to go, but I had no space. So, uh, do you know, I, cause you know, Tommy drove the race, you drove the race car. I drove the race car at the end of last year when they invited that select group of journalists, um, right yeah. before Petit. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, what as I said at the time is I'm sure it was good at first, but four years with four teams, two racing in Europe, two racing in the States, unbelievable team of the best drivers, Chip Ganassi racing, refining on this car for four years. And to get to sample it, what was good at first, what had been refined to like the highest level, it was, it was breathtaking. I mean, my neck really in about 12 laps was out, yeah. out of gas. But <laughs> it, everything was, you know, I, and I drove the Viper in 12 and 13, which we never got yeah. to fully develop. And so even that, when I was full time, was nowhere close to no. what this. And so I, you know, it was just a huge honor growing up, uh, actually, with with a Ford GT40 mm. in in the family for a period. Um, and so I I have a bef long before I was a Ford racer, I I kind of had a little Ford Ford blue in mm. me. I'll tell you something, Henry. This is how it went with this test. He uh, at the last minute said to me, "You know, if I'm if I'm too tall." You can do it, JB. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> look at him. He jammed himself in there. That's in the I, There are many metaphors I could use for what you look like in there right now, but I was pretty I won't. sure at Laguna when I did my fitting, yeah. I, I'm like, I don't think I'm going to fit. No, I was hoping. And not. they <laughs> and they pulled the, the the whole liner out of the seat, and I got it. And then I'm like, oh my god, I yeah, fit like I know. pretty well, better wow. than I fit in the Viper. So, um, so when yeah, we we. We brought some uh, we brought some customers in too for um, for a fitting and you know we have a, a couple customers who are you know well over six feet and and they could fit so it was um it's a surprisingly uh, it's a surprisingly roomy cabin for not not a whole lot of uh, no. No, not a whole lot of actual room. So one thing that I've been told that I have to go and see and I I was chatting with someone when we were at Belle Isle last year for the IMSA race to come and see the Ford Museum and and have a walk around apparently is is a must do you've done have you done it, it oh yeah it's a must -do. It's take it'll take a full day a full day yeah when you look back at right from the early you know model t when you look at the museum if you ever get in there what car you know what what's your car out of the the family lineup from the last hundred years what do you go wow i'd i'd, I'd have to have one you know from the old days i know you'd have a four gt but you know <laughs> from the older days uh, no, it's a great question. Um, you know, one of the interesting cars that I think is in there is the, the proto, the, the first Mustang prototype that we built, um, just before. So this was probably, this probably would have been 61 or 62, I think. And, uh, Dan Gurney drove it at a parade lab. I think I want to say it like Watkins Glen. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting, car and you can tell how sort of the dna evolved from that into what became the mustang and uh, it's you know just this little two-seat uh coupe and it's uh it's but it's got a really striking design um but that's just one of the really really interesting cars at, at the henry ford museum i mean there are um multi 
you know, there are cards from all brands, from all walks of life. And then there are all these, you know, there's uh, agriculture and there's uh, huge steam trains and, um, you know, old airplanes. I mean, it's, it's an awesome, awesome place. So, yeah, I, I highly recommend going yeah. if you're ever in the Dearborn area. What, what struck me when I went there, it was the timing of when Ford, and when Ford Motor Company was started to when the Rouge River plant was, I mean, that is an unbelievable project in itself. And then the museum was built. The museum wasn't built in the 60s or 70s. It was built in the 30s. And so just, yeah. just the amount of stuff that your great grandfather kind of got going and it leads into, I think there's something you're, you know, business people and families that are still involved in their companies. It's kind of like american royalty because that's what we're based on and so um you know i think people root a little extra hard and i just saw a stat since you're in investor relations now that the number one stock traded on robin hood that people are trading little micro shares of is ford motor company wow. do you get the sense that america is rooting for ford i mean it's a competitive deal and you got to keep delivering and executing but do you feel that in the family and in the company yeah, I, I do. I mean, I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we have a, we're a company that has a great history and a great legacy and we've been around, you know, over a hundred years and, um, you know, we've always been rooted here in America. Um, you know, we've got more employees than any other automaker in America. We build more vehicles than any other automaker in America. And so I think people take pride in that. I know we take pride in that. And so, uh, I, yeah, I, I do feel like people are rooting for us and, you know, I mean, especially, you know, these days, given the, the pandemic that we're in, that we were able to retool some of our plants and start building ventilators and, and face shields and, you know, kind of try to do our part to, to help other people through this crisis. You know, that I think, again, that sort of um, that, that that builds some credibility with po with folks. And so, you know, we've we've always been a part of this country and, and we are a global company. But uh, with our roots in America, we're always uh, we've always been, you know, kind of our home base here. So I, I do think people appreciate that. And I think it means a lot to people. And I know it means a lot to us. God, look at that photograph. Can you see it, Henry, on your on your yeah. phone? Look at that. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, those were the days when everybody could go outside <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and do it. Um, have you enjoyed not having to put on a jacket and tie for two months? Oh my gosh, I have loved it, and uh, I, you know, I haven't been shaving regularly, which you can probably tell either. So uh, yeah, I have to say, I, I do sort of enjoy working from home. Oh my, how old are your kids? Do you mind me asking? Because no, not at all. They're they're four, two, and six months, and so they, uh, you know, they they enjoy hopping on some of my conference calls with me as well, yeah. which is always entertaining. But uh, you know, it's it's been uh, it's been great. Wow. And we touched on this yesterday, but that didn't air, uh, or it aired, but it didn't it wasn't stored. Um, you know, you the stint before Investor Relations was was strategy, and you probably can't tell us a lot about the secrets on where you're going. But what gets you excited? Uh, obviously, it's a, it's never been more competitive. But what gets you excited about the future of the automobile? People keep predicting, you know, the love of driving. Kids aren't into cars. What gets you excited when you look forward for for Ford Motor Company and the and the car industry? You know, what what's get, what gets excited to, uh, for for me is that you know we are just we're always trying to think through how can we better serve our customers and so you know whether that is you know different types of powertrains like electric vehicles um one day whether that's autonomous vehicles our commercial vehicles um obviously our, our retail vehicles but you know we are really um you know i i just i feel like our focus right now on really trying to de deliver what we think our customers want and need um, is stronger than ever, and, and it has to be because we work in a very uh, competitive and evolving uh, and dynamic industry. And so, if we are if we're not paying attention to our customers, uh, then we're at risk. And so, we, um, you know, I think are really laser focused on uh, on on delivering what our what we know our customers want and need. And so that to me that's exciting because we you know we can provide not just vehicles for our customers, but uh, but solutions. And, um, and to me, that's the, that's the ultimate gratification is knowing that, uh, our customers needs are met. Yeah. Well, before we let you go, I am going to re-ask the question, but phrase it differently from, from yesterday. It's a great thing. We can do it again. Um, we feel it was fantastic for the everyday person to watch Ford versus Ferrari, because finally, once and for all, people realize what we what we all did all those years, you know, my dad was still being told, will he get a real job having won it five times by his mum? You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's like racing is that weird thing and it's over in France. 
Um, I know it yeah. didn't portray your gra- great grandfather, uh, your grandfather very well. Are you getting moved on again? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm being, being asked to move again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, jeez. I mean, you know, as I said, for, for when when I when I saw Henry at Le Mans, he's wearing his Ford shirt, and I went to and I I was about to interview him, and I went. For anyone else, that is a logo. For him, it's a monogram. Um, so this is classic. This is fantastic. Move, sorry, move along. Creep, just there's, keep moving. There's a creeper in the neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but just as a general awareness, entertainment, bringing bringing it to the masses. Uh, did you enjoy most of it? Four versus. I did. Three. Yeah. I, no. I listen. I, I I thought it was a very well done movie. I thought the acting was great. The cinematography, the race scenes were incredible. Uh, you know, as we discussed yesterday, my 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 only beef was I I didn't think that the portrayal of my grandfather was particularly um, not not just flattering, obviously, but it wasn't very accurate. And and that's fine. You know, I mean, it's it's a Hollywood film. They get to take their their liberties. And that's you know, that's the way it goes. And, and uh, you know, uh, so it, it is what it is. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think it captured him as a person um as a as a human and and so that was a little frustrating but um but no all in all i thought it was a great movie i enjoyed seeing it and uh you know as we discussed yesterday i mean it it a- anytime you can you can bring a new audience into the magic of le mans i think is a is a good thing well and, and the funny thing is days of thunder awesome. was really popular amongst the people who knew nothing about racing and everybody in racing was like oh my god yeah. it was horrible they kept running and crashing and what i i thought other than a little bit of nitpicking you know, your dad said you don't downshift at the end of the Molson straight to pass someone, you know, yeah, yeah, but right. other, other than that, it was almost universally liked by, yeah. by people that were in the industry and people that weren't, which means the filmmakers did a pretty damn good job. They really did. Well, listen, before yeah. you, before we witness live the arrest of Henry Ford the third <laughs> for, for, I don't know what it's called when you're loitering out, just, you know, if you're anch- next time we talk to you, we don't want you to be wearing an ankle bracelet. That was, <laughs> yeah. Not what we need. Oh, we, well, we do appreciate the effort. Yeah. You're, you're a real gamer and we appreciate it. Thank you, Henry. We'll see no, you soon. No, no, it was my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. I, I really enjoyed it. Always good to talk to you guys. Right, take care. Bye. You too. <laughs> oh, that is just, I can see the trees moving behind <laughs> as he's gently, because obviously, you, yeah. oh, that's great. This would, this would be a good time. We should have done it with him on, but to say that what pulls our beautiful, oh, polished Airstream is the craziest, badass F-350 uh, with Which all the I bells love. and whistles. Uh, and I towed this brand new chassis with the 72 Airstream body on um, back from Ohio. And it was the tow hitch and everything and the stabilizers were set so well on that 350. There were moments that I had to check myself yeah, because she was flying. And like it's like so when one of the trailer wheels passed you? That was a that was an unforeseen <laughs> unforeseen blip. Um, which, which, which all's well that ends well. All's well. I made it, didn't I? Uh, unfortunately, our chef, thanks to the Michelin Guide, can't uh, join us. Uh, not that he can't join us, thanks to the Michelin Guide. The Michelin Guide was setting up Teague Moriarty from Sons and Daughters in San Francisco, uh, but he really he's, it's a busy time for chefs. They're getting back, literally getting their businesses back together, and he carved out some time for us yesterday. We'll try again, maybe next week. But we should pump him up a little bit. I mean, we, we were oh, really yeah. excited. He, he His restaurant, Sons and Daughters, um, earned a Michelin star. Uh, he was also uh, James Beard Young Chef, uh, one of Forbes 30 Under 30 Influential yeah. People. So, I mean, a real yeah. rock star in his space. Uh, and turns out grew up in Santa Cruz. Um, and we said, are you a car guy? He said, well, not really. But then he went on to say, I had a, a Datsun 1600 Roadster. We listed so, them so all he up. Was. Yeah. And, uh, and so we were, un- uh, were bummed that he couldn't come back. But we will definitely get him on the show soon. But one of the things we were going to do right after that as part of our partnership with Haggerty is exploring some of the amazing things that they are creating for the driver, for people that have the love of cars. Uh, And one of the ones that, to be honest, is totally addictive and you should do it. You know how you use Airbnb? Well, instead of Airbnb, you have DriveShare. And on DriveShare, you go on, you've got their app and put in the zip code or the ta- destination uh, of where you're going to go and it'll bring up all these cars. People have registered with Haggerty for their classic cars for you to be able to rent. And it's, sometimes it's bizarrely inexpensive and as you'd expect sometimes 
very expensive. Prices are set by the individual owners. Totally. So. But how cool? Because we said, okay, TK. We're going to San Fran. We're going to go to Sons we're and Daughters. We're going to fly. Yep, fly up there. We're going to grab a car to, to add a little spice. What are you getting? Mine involves something very special. Uh, it was a very attractive DeLorean that I just thought to myself, if I'm going up there, I'm going to be – I don't want it chauffeured, obviously. Uh, um, the way I'm reading this, JB, you yeah. don't have the option. You can either have it come to your event or you can be driven. They're not letting you drive. <laughs> In principle, this was my car because – I really would like to go back and do a few things all over again. I was going to you want to get out of 2020. Yeah. <laughs> if I did this again, this you'd be April Rose sitting here, not you. So that's it. No, I'm joking. You know that. I don't mean that. I don't mean that. Uh, but I would change some other stuff. Um, sorry, kids. Uh, okay. Uh, what What about you? What were your drive? Well, for me, I was like, okay, uh, you know, Teague is from Santa Cruz, surf deal. We had Henry Ford on. What could I do that? Ties all this in, and I came up with 71 Ford Bronco. Oh, I like that. Look at that. So, Whoa. Uh, 750 bucks a day. I was there was a there was a 50 Ford sedan, uh, which was in the Ford theme. But this is much more fun for uh, pull the top off, cruise up Highway One a little bit, and wait, make your way in for dinner. Well, uh, what a fun thing to do, and I promise you, it is pretty addictive. Uh, and what a wonderful way for you to sort of explore your driving destination when you get there properly with the uh, use of someone I else's should car. probably maybe to make a little extra cash I get hit up all the time hey can you you hit me up I and did. I said yes I won't charge yeah. you but for other people I'm putting an El Gallo up for chauffeur drives you can do weddings bar mitzvahs yeah. graduations yeah you my, you my would nieces. drive it though I would yeah drive. yeah of course because you because yeah. you you've got a little on your on your head I, to get through doors. Yeah, crown. Yeah, yeah. crown. You have to be. I took my that. nieces who are now twenty five, but I took uh, one of them and all of her girlfriends around for the the whole ritual of of inviting to the backwards dance okay. is, is a big deal now. How you ask the ask is a big production, and so I drove them around and they asked their guys, "Don't be chicken, go to okay. the dance with me." Wow. So he's just an all round entertainer. You've been online again. I have been online again. Um, something you know, we keep talking about how there's always something new on Haggerty. Literally two days ago, new show launched on Haggerty called Daily Driver, uh, from the guys uh, Matt Hardigree used to be with Jalopnik is behind this. He's uh, yeah. and um, and so it's it's part uh, interviews. I think Parker Klingerman was on the first episode, and then they had uh, actually tying into the Ford. They had spy shots of and they do automotive news, and it's a daily daily show. And uh, Tiffany Stone is the host, and so they had uh, the new That's Ford great. Mach One in spy livery was on there. So uh, so check out Daily Driver on Haggerty for your daily news fix. Totally love that. Well, we oh something I saw. Well, did you see Supercar Blondie? Doing her, the, I mean, if you don't know Alex, aka Supercar Blondie, she actually was one of our first guests at Long Beach and uh, the Grand Prix last year. Ouch. Super, super cool. Huge following. I see her at a lot of Michelin related events, uh, but she went to a scrapyard. Well, actually, for those junkyard. who don't know Supercar Blondie, how big is her following on Instagram? Million, four or five million. Four or five million people. Yeah. And what she's become known for, she's based in Dubai, but she started doing it herself, and now she is a big hitter in the media world where all the car companies fall all over themselves yeah. and they deliver their concept cars and so basically she gets her hands on stuff before anybody else and gives walk arounds and tours and little drives whether it's the new bugatti or whatever but this is a little bit different take on her yeah she went she went out to this dubai style junkyard where they have bentleys and rolls royces and g wagons obviously some have been wrecked uh but some have been uh, some of you some pretty awful. He went underneath a truck in that, didn't he? I think. Um, and some obviously have just been abandoned and impounded, but it's a pretty high rent junkyard. So it's kind of fun to watch. Just, you know, it's the kind of stuff we like to look for because especially when it's your friends doing it. And I think Alex does uh, one also of the best Also fascinating. Jobs. We all heard, you know, Dubai had such a boom and you heard about these cars. They'd find them in the airport parking lots abandoned. And when, when the economy came apart, it was one of the most hyper speculative yeah. bubbles. And when the air came out of it, you had all these exotics just parked, abandoned. Some of them were foreclosed on. This is where they go to. Wow, look at that. Well, I know a man who would be crying if he was in a junkyard like this because seeing damaged cars probably isn't his inspiration. Probably he, not. Uh, but he joined us. He was going to join us yesterday. 
And I don't think this would be possible without our COVID lockdown because he is way too busy and important. But Jay Ward, who is the creative force behind the Cars franchise at Pixar, is joining us from home. Hey, Jay, welcome again. <laughs> Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Guys. How are you? Very well, very well. Just like you guys rolling with the punches of working from home and trying to get everything done. I bet. Do you, um, I was thinking about it for, for someone like an artist, because you really are at heart, uh, you know, an artist, not getting out and seeing inspiration from the world around us, the cars, the car events, the, the racing. Whew, it's a, it, that's, a, that's a real drag, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, the calendar, as you guys know, has just slowly fallen apart. It wasn't like everything's over at once. It was, oh, um, you know, it was when, well, when Pebble happened, it all kind of fell apart. But even even stuff all the way out in the fall is just slowly going away. And you go, all right, we just got to roll with the punches. 2020 for car events is kind of on the ropes. Yeah, it's like, a lo like a lost year. Yeah. Um, now, you're a really busy guy because literally anything cars is under your purview. It's not just the movies. It's the theme parks now. Tell us what all you oversee. Yeah. So we have, uh, I, I was the creative director for franchise for, or sorry, the creative director for cars for just a long time because cars is so big to the Walt Disney company and to Pixar, right? We have theme parks and games and publishing. Um, and th the role was created for me bespoke because cars became such a huge phenomenon that they wanted somebody at our side who could sort of, creatively guide the storytelling for all these projects, right? Um, and now we realize what I do for, I can do for all of our franchise because it's important that every movie we make um, lives on in a way that we feel reflects what we made the movie. So it could be a theme park project, but sometimes it's a Pixar miniature golf in Australia. They made a thing called Pixar putt that I oversaw. Um, it can be a laser light show uh, in South America. It could be um, a, a father and son or, or mother and daughter driving event in the UK. It, it can be a lot of things because Cars as a franchise and Pixar as a brand uh, goes around the world and is loved around the world. So your job is even bigger than I thought it was, basically, is what you're telling <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> It's gotten bigger, but uh, it's the, what I was already doing just scaled up. And obviously, you know, when a movie comes out, there's more activity. And then as that movie fades, you know, it, level, it levels out again. So there's sort of peaks and valleys with the emphasis. So we had a movie called Onward that came out back in March. Unfortunately, it came out right about when the pandemic hit. So it wasn't in the box office very long. But um, these two elf brothers drive this 70s van in the movie. And I loved this van so much. I just, I, I just drove them nuts. I said, we have to make a life-size version of this van. We have to make a real, the van's name is Guinevere. So I said, we have to make a real Guinevere. And they said, yeah, okay. So I found a shop in Burbank and I had it made exactly to our oh. specs. And uh, then I said, oh, my gosh, uh, somebody at Walt Disney World saw it. And they said, well, we want one for Walt Disney World. We ended up making, I don't know, three or four of these vans. There's one in yeah. South America, but it's a life-size Guinevere van. And it, that, that's the kind of projects I, I really love. Well, you, I don't know if you heard Henry Ford talking, but we all have these moments that are seared in. And Disney has done such a great job of, of sparking children's imaginations that literally influence them for their whole lives. Now yeah. it's expanded to Pixar and so forth. So some people, that will be the favorite thing in their lives. How do you know when, you know, how does the process, how do those get developed? And, and you know right away that this, like you said, you knew you had to build a real version of it. There it is. There it is. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Every movie that Pixar makes, we, we always start from a great story because you can spend just as much time and money and effort on a bad movie as a good one, right? You see, you see movies that cost a lot of money and they were garbage. Yeah. Um, and so our, our, our focus is always telling a great story because if you have a great story, you've got a great movie, right? Ford versus Ferrari was awesome for people that weren't even car people because totally. the story was great, right? Yeah. You wanted to, you want to know what happened to that guy, uh, to Ken Miles. And, um, so when every movie we make, that is ingrained in our DNA. And so every movie we make, we know somebody will love and resonate and connect with it. And so it makes my job a lot easier. Now, yeah. you, you say that. That seems like that's obvious that everybody in the movie business. So how do people lose the script, literally, where, you know, is it because they're so close to it and their minds filling in gaps? How does that happen? You know, that, that happens with everybody because uh, when you are telling a story, you get too close to it and you don't know what to get rid of and what to keep. Um, we have a very unique process at Pixar that I think has now um, 
it's it's been spread out around to to Walt Disney Studios and other places of we are what we're called a director driven studio. So the director drives the vision for the movie. It's got to be their voice, their story. But there is a group of people that are their peers, that are their creative peers, that are like a brain trust for them that say, hey, I think it's great. What you're doing is cool. But did you think about the bad guy doesn't work for this or that this character is confusing? And it's very important to have creative peers um, guide you along because you can't see, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees. And so it's an important part of the process that helps us uh, have a movie that is balanced and works for everybody. I remember uh, last year when we were together, I think in Newport uh, for the Audrain Motor Week, you, we were, no, maybe it was, it was dinner somewhere we were talking about it. No, it was at Pebble Beach. Do you remember we had the dinner and everyone was there? I can't remember who. We were terrible it. lives. Just hard, just terrible lives. Just hard, terrible lives. Or was it Villa Deste? Yeah. I'm just getting so confused. <laughs> no. Um, hate, don't hate on me, everyone. Um, I know. No. It, and we were chatting and you said that it was your career as the cars guy in was, was really because you, based on your authenticity and your knowledge, and you would sit in meetings and people would be, they were developing things and you'd be like, actually, you know, the car, the car doesn't have that. That has has the exhaust. You know, it's a twin pipe, and a, right? Isn't that how? Right. It, and so your voice yeah. became louder. Yeah. So every film we have at Pixar is rooted in authenticity, right? So you guys showed a moment from Nemo, and when they did Nemo, they did diving trips in Australia to make sure they got everything correct for what you would see. Uh, when we did Wall-E, they got to go to the trash dump. Lucky guys. Lucky guys. <laughs> um, and so every movie we do that level of research. Cars, because it's based on an existing real thing that people know, right? Like a Hudson Hornet. If you have yeah. a 51 Hudson Hornet, you notice if we put a piece of trim in the wrong place. And so they did a great job of trying to get that stuff accurate. But I was able to, at that nerdy level, go, you know, actually the bolt pattern's different. On It's not a wide five. It's a narrow one. And <laughs> you, know, you guys know bias flies versus radials. And they were like, what? And so yeah. I taught a whole series of Pixar called um, Auto 101, where I just walk them through the history of the automobile and different types and brands and eras, and 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 it was really helpful for the whole crew. Wow, who is who's your who's your personal favorite out of the creations? Um, for for cars, you know, I mentioned Doc Hudson, and why that character resonates with me so much is because it was the last role that Paul Newman did before he passed away. Ah, yeah. And Paul Newman was a real racer, as you guys know. The man truly was a car guy. Yes, Tommy knows very well. And he brought so much to that character and so much more. And, and the beauty of it was, you know, we let him make his own lines. You, you couldn't script what he said because it was so genuine. That you just said, say what you would say. No and it made it such a better movie. It really did. Wow. What a sp and, and obviously you'd work with him. You'd work closely with him while he was in the voiceover studio. You, yeah, and normally, and, and at that point, I was managing the character team. So I was actually managing the building process of the character. So your director and script soups and those folks would be in the room with him. He didn't quite look like that when we recorded no. him. I remember that. He was just maybe a year or two old, maybe just a year or two older. A little more mature. But I'll tell you one funny story about Paul Newman. He, um, you know, he was pretty advanced in years. By 2006 or 2004 or five, when we started recording him, he wasn't a young guy. And he came in the studio, and I think, for a lot of people, they weren't used to having somebody of his age that was going to a recording studio. And he sat down in the seat to record and he grabbed a water bottle and he hit my neck, cracked the water bottle, bone cracked and everybody freaked out. And the reason he did that was just to, um, to put people at ease, yeah. to have them go, all right, guys, all right, let's, let's get all that out of the way. Let's, let's get into this. And, and you know, just Paul Newman. <laughs> That, did you ever see him do that? I did not see him do that. Um, but I, it's funny hearing him talk about his lines. I used to say it's so funny. He, he really was like a poet. And he would say these lines and they would be so spare. And he wouldn't explain them. And, and sometimes you're like, I'm like, what is he talking about? But, you know, you would work on it in your mind. And sometimes years later, it's like, that's what he was saying. And, and so... Um, uh, I mean, a man. I mean, he. But behind the wheel, he he really he really could do it. So that yeah. that's what gave him credibility in our world. You know, yeah. a lot of people come in and they don't really have it, but he really had it. So. Yep. And uh, so he, we were teammates at uh, when when he won uh, Daytona. 
and I, so I always know what age he was at what year because in 1995 we ran car number 70 because he was 70 years old. Oh, okay. Uh, and nobody. Yeah. So cool. he was 80 then when this picture was taken. Yeah. Wow. In, in fact, we did sponsor a car of his with the car's logo. Daytona Do you remember prototype. that, Tommy? Yes. It was the yeah. Flame. I think Bordet drove that car because yeah. it was new, all the Newman Haas guys drove it. Yeah, yeah I forgot yes. about that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So where where were you brought up, Jay? Uh, my hometown is Kansas City, Missouri, right in the middle of the United States. The mecca for cars, obviously. Oh, yeah. yeah. Actually, Kansas City is a big car oh, town, right. oddly yeah. enough. It is a big car town. I don't know why, but they do love cars in Kansas City. But uh, we moved out to California when I was fairly young. In fact, I went to high school in the Central Valley in Modesto, which I call lovingly the armpit of California. Um, but that is where George Lucas went to high school. Gee. And a lot of people don't realize, but American Graffiti is specifically about his youth in Modesto in the early 60s because the cruising culture was so huge there. What a movie. Yeah, and, what a movie. And George yeah. Lucas went, so you know, at that point he hadn't done Star Wars yet. He had done a sci-fi movie called THX 1138, which is a great movie with Robert Duvall. And he went to Modesto, back to Modesto, and he said, I wanna make this movie about my youth, and cruising culture and going to the high school, it was called Downey High School. And the city of Modesto, and this is again, early seventies, George isn't on the map yet. And they go, eh, I, I don't think we want this movie about this sort of derelict culture in our town. We're trying to portray ourselves as a Bay Area <laughs> yeah. up and comer. So I don't, I don't think we want to film that here. And he leaves and he goes to Petaluma, which is you know closer up to my way in the Bay Area and actually closer to him in, in San Rafael area. And they're like, we love it. What do you want to do? And all that stuff that would have been shot in the town of oh. Modesto was shot in Petaluma oh. and turned out to be a cult classic. And then I think, you know, Modesto was like striving over itself to try to catch up. But everything yeah. in that movie was about his his Modesto years. And they called yeah. it Dewey High School in the movie. Uh -huh. What, so was it in your original town, birthplace or was it when you moved to California that, you know, we just heard from Henry talking about when he first realized cars were in his DNA. Um, what, what was your moment? What, when we, what was your sort of childhood epiphany? So my uh, my father was an auto wholesaler. He would buy cars, fix them up and sell them. So that that was always there, but he was in, he stayed in Kansas City. I moved to California with my mom at a young age. They got divorced. And I would go back in the summers to visit him. And he, because he was a self business guy, he would set me at the desk in the front of Ward Automotive with, on, with the blotter. You guys remember you'd have a blotter on your desk mm -hmm. and the pens and the Coke machine. And he'd be in the back, what I call wheel in detail. He'd be like running the wheel and stripe tape in those days. <laughs> Farrah Fawcett poster, you know, the music blaring. Yeah, yeah, and uh -huh. I'd be in the front drawing custom vans and, and, and cars in the front. It's like, you got no choice. You're, you're just, yeah. you're in all the way at that point. Isn't that brilliant? Just to, uh, everyone has their different path. You know, like when we're talking with John Oates, how, yeah. you know, how, where cars first appeal to him. And there's other people who, well, let's face it, even if they've been in love with them their whole life, it doesn't mean you have the wherewithal to buy your dream car. Right. But it sure is the first thing you buy when you get some spare cash, even though maybe if you had advice, it wouldn't be what you should spend your money on. Um, I love that about them because it is, it is, it is that my son at, at, uh, you know, at 16 is already talking about the fact that he really does want you know, a Senna more than anything. So he's a little, little learning curve yet before that. It's a great beginner's car. Fantastic beginner's car. car. <laughs> so yeah. fun because you can like do drive-ins on the rear tail. And stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's lovely. Aspiration is a good thing though. It really is. One more nerdy thing I have to tell you. So the other way that I got this very encyclopedic knowledge about cars and which actually ironically helped with the movie Cars was Sunday would be the day that the big newspaper would come out. And Sunday was the day that you would get the classifieds because if somebody was only going to run the classifieds one day, they'd run Sunday. Again, this is going back to when I was a kid, Tommy, you and I are probably about the same age. And I'd always take the Sunday paper and I'd lay it out on the floor in our living room and I'd go to the classic car section. And then I'd grab a book called The Car Spotter's Guide by Tad Burness. Tad Burness was this guy from San Jose that wrote The Car Spotter's Guide. And it literally was clipped out photos of cars year by year. It's, it's on my bookshelf right now, that book that I had as a kid. And, and I would look up the car and it'd be like 57 Plymouth. Uh, Belvedere, and he said, "Okay, cool." And I'd circle the nerdy, circle ah, the car, so connected yep. visually with what it was. Yep. Wow. Yep. Wow. Yep. And it's amazing you don't forget a thing from that part of your life, right? You probably still could remember all those things. I remember the the table in the front of Road and Track that had zero to sixty, lateral acceleration, braking distances from 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 back in the day and i'd studied every i said did anything go faster than the 930 zero to 60 which was 5.0 so um wow. yes 
Isn't that funny how it is? The it's like, but we talked to Brian. If you talk to Brian Redman, he'll mm-hmm. tell you what gear ratios he yeah. used. You, talk, you know, back in the day, Sterling would tell you. It's um, I'm blessed with uh, you know a really really short memory stick in here, really small. <laughs> I think it's like two megabyte. Well, so I'm. It's not encyclopedia. It's more pamphlet yeah. like memory. Can I tell you what I descri- what I was best described as once, Jay? <laughs> yeah, Dory. <laughs> Dory. I'm like Dory the fish. In in I'm like one minute I'm like it's so good to meet you. Do you know it's so good to meet you? Uh no, I'm but you know, I actually am not that you're, bad. You're in the moment. Yeah, totally I'm, in I, the I'm moment. A, I'm a I'm a for the moment kind of guy. But I do love and I know you do because you're in your library right now. I I have become really uh, you know, a consumer of beautiful coffee table books that that capture my because I like them. I like the art of them. I like the presentation of them. Because um, now magazines, let's face it, there are we our choice in car magazines is is on in the paper form is definitely gone down. Although that new Magneto one, I don't know if you've seen it. I love that Magneto one. Magneto's oh. great, and Haggerty. Haggerty. I, mean, I, I, too, yeah. I told the uh, Webster that the Haggerty magazine is is a drive. It, it's that magazine is one of the best. American car magazines, bar none, it just is. They've sucked yeah. up a lot of the great talent from you know yeah. from Larry Webster, Aaron Robinson, uh, yeah. Preston yeah. Lerner contributes. Yeah. yeah, a lot of great great folks there. But great what? Did, but so what? Did, what book have you had recently that, that that has appealed to you? I've got a couple. Um, I was just speaking with my friend uh, Mark that used to his name's Mark that used to be at uh, McLaren and Design. He just moved over to, I think they're called Charge. They're making that all electric fastback Mustang car over in the UK wow. that's got a carbon fiber body. Yeah, it's called Charge Automotive, okay. and we were chatting, and he showed me this book, and I was like, I have to get this. This is, this is a Toshin book. If you know Toshin, oh, they're yeah. they're they're higher end books. There's a Toshin bookstore in LA, I think, over yeah. in Beverly Hills, and this thing is chock full of American car graphics from the from like the great era. This is this is the kind of book I wish we had on cars. This oh, would have wow. been very helpful yeah. to us. Great resource, huh? Wow, um, great you, graphics. And, and to, uh, to think, do you see things in there that would just inspire you? Nick, you never know when yeah, they're going to come up, like, and you go that typeface. Yeah, and design too. I mean, automotive design. It's funny as you guys were talking to Henry, I started pulling stuff like, "There's the car he loves on yep, the cover yeah. of sports car <laughs> graphic." I was like, "Yeah, I keep every. I have tons of car magazines going back to the '50s. Um, here's another great book. A lot of people don't have. Ford made a book." in 1953 about their 50th anniversary oh my gosh super rare look at this picture that um norman rockwell did inside of the three generations of ford henry edsel really too yeah and bill the second and uh or or, uh sorry henry the second and this is like literally how they make a car but look at the graphics in this thing like this is the kind of stuff i geek out on too is just Mm -hmm. the illustrations Mm -hmm. isn't it fabulous really really good i wish that um at, that uh, Henry the Third could have seen that, and then this book is one of my favorites for new books. I don't know if you guys know who uh, E.T. Gregory is, but E.T. Gregory is the man who designed all the great for, for the '30s, and he designed the Continental for Etzel. Oh, and E.T. Gregory was a was a uh, sorry, he's over here. He was a speedboat designer, and Etzel was the guy who said to his dad Henry, who was pragmatic, "You have to have style. You have to have design. You have to offer colors." And Etzel was the one who purchased Lincoln. You know, Ford didn't have Lincoln. That was Etzel. He got Lincoln. And he started Mercury, the mid-level brand. They didn't have a middle. That was all Etzel. Unbelievable. And uh, just phenomenal. This has got literally the clay models, all the early 30s stuff that is so Art Deco. I have a 39 Mercury convertible. So the prototype of my car is in this book. Wow. Incredible. So I imagine that after all, with all your knowledge, that huge database you have, plus the artistic side of it, you're able to look at a car and tell a lot about the kind of person that would drive it, I imagine. Correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think so. There's, there's some psychology to yeah, that. I'd yeah, I'd love to. Can we just go over there, Jason, again? Go towards that. This is my now, don't tell me who owns the car. Let me just look at it and see if I can tell you about the owner. Without, without, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. Okay, so looking at this car, here's what I would say immediately. Most likely an ax murderer. <laughs> Am I close? So close. Yeah. yeah. This is an introvert. This is obviously an introvert. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Doesn't doesn't want to park somewhere and not get noticed. Uh, Somebody who cares a lot about fuel mileage. Somebody who's very thrifty about fuel mileage. Yeah. Yeah. As Uh, as I would like to say as politely as I can, it's bigger on the outside than it is on the inside. Oh my goodness! You know he loves it more than anything. I mean, honestly, this is his favorite show he's ever done, 
of any kind, I think, because you're on it, Henry's on uh, it, and the chicken car's on it. The chicken car is, is a legacy of its own. The fact, you know, you, you guys have talked to Bruce Meyer before, and Bruce Meyer always says, I don't, I don't own these cars. I'm the caretaker. Well, he's the caretaker of some amazing cars. Yes. But, Tommy, that's what it is for you. I mean, obviously, you're just the caretaker of El Gallo. Someday, some kid is going to come up to you and say, I have to have this car. And you, you might know. have to pass the legacy on. Well, I mean, this, this leads into, I mean, the, there have been some knockoffs made. But just the, the attitude, whoever crafted the actual bits, I mean, he's, 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 got, he's got some he's got, attitude. He's got attitude. Definitely got some cocky. attitude. It was very cocky. Very yeah, cocky. Very so, cocky. I mean. So I was going to ask you, you know, you basically imbue cars with personalities and so forth. Um, yeah. Certain cars lend themselves. What do you see today that's modern, that has charisma, that you would would cast as a character? Is there a villain car that's for sale today or something like that? You know, you, you have some easy things to do with shapes. Um, you know, when you see, you're showing that supercar Blondie footage I was watching of that giant Rolls Rolls. The, the the wraith the one with the with the coach doors and a, and and that looks like a baddie you know in, in a good way it looks like a tough villain car looking at the face of a of a rolls when you see something small and cute like a like a miata or a you know a little suzuki they look like innocent cars or young cars so we usually cast them based on the the, the body style does emulate something right like a muscle car usually looks tough and that language is purposeful. The people designing them have a, a, a design mandate of what they're trying to get across in that car. And so it's, it makes it easier for us for, for that casting of those vehicles. Fillmore was the old hippie Volkswagen bus. What else would he be? Yeah. You know, Sarge was the World War II Jeep who was kind of, you know, militant and yelling at him. Mm -hmm. um, Ramon, the 59 uh, Chevy Impala lowrider. What, what other car would you possibly cast for Ramon? So it, 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 it made our job easier to say, you see those cars and most of the people in the room go, I, I know what that is. That's cool. And that's what you want. It's funny. You see, I like that. The, the marketing people aren't always in sync with the design people because you have these cars out and there's the press event and they basically tell you what they want you to feel about it. But sometimes it's spot on, but the market decides what the car is, right? That's right. And so like one car that the only car that I like that my wife also likes is the Dodge Challenger, which our friend Ralph design or was oversaw yep. the design of and so you're like that car it just looks right but so, it, are there certain cars that you know you hear the you hear the speak and you're like uh no not not gonna fly i'll tell you a funny example is you, when ford came out with the ford flex in 2009 and the ford flex is the boxy one and it's, and it's yeah. polarizing some people love it some people don't like my wife love loved the ford flex when it came out i think we we got two or three of them in a row for her she loved the flex but Jay Mays was the, was the designer of that team. And Jay, Jay Mays was leading up that team. And he said, Ford tried to get it to be this like a uh, funky urban, they had Grandmaster Flash do the thing for it and all this stuff. And that's not who the audience was. And he said, we always thought of it as like the town and country and like the yep. wood siding and the picnic in the back and that sort of, you know, um, almost like the a modern mad sort of station wagon thing and 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 that's kind of what it was to us yeah. and so yeah I, exactly i think they sort of missed the boat on the marketing for the flex because it had a very odd boxy vibe but if you understood what they were going for that retro station wagon feel you kind of go ah it, yeah. it's it's cool yeah yeah i've always wanted to do one of these uh, with a woody but with carbon uh, carbon and Kevlar to simulate the wood, like a modern twist with road race wheels. So I've always wanted to do a minivan and totally do it right. Like because it, it, when you drive a minivan, I did it when I had a car review site. My review went, once I'm in it, I feel really good about myself, you know, because I, I have 18 cup holders. I have three televisions. I had, it was the Chrysler Town and Country. I was driving around. I said, but to get in it. The walk of shame. No, I crawl. I look like a special forces team member. I come in like down the hedgerow, no one looking at me, so I could like slide in because it just wasn't cool. But if you have kids, as you know, you know it, it's it's the perfect the perfect car. Before we let you go, off, you span an interest. You have an interesting seat to to span sort of the virtual world and the real world, and you have a chance to shape the the entertainment world. What will our how will our entertainment change, do you think, over the next 10 years? Just generally. How, I mean, we live in a different... There's my van. Um, yeah, <laughs> god awful, but I'll make it cool. Um, what's, our, 
what's our you know what's our future look like and the way we're going to consume our entertainment do you think it's it's changing right now and i think that you know one of the things i do a lot of talks on is the future of entertainment in the automobile which we could talk a whole nother time about that because I, that is a huge factor to think about entertainment in the vehicle but just to talk for a moment about movies we've seen during this pandemic that disney plus which is our streaming network we hit 50 million subscribers in a record amount of time because people are still hungry for content. Yeah. Um, and, and look, people are going to go back to the theaters. That theater experience will, people are going to desire that again in a safe way, obviously. And we want people to go back to the movies and experience in a safe way. But I think you're also just going to continue to see more people um, absorbing content when they want it and how they want it. And I also think that window between the movie theater and the on home that that window is going to keep shrinking down where it's almost you just have the option the same day of what you want to see theater owners aren't going to like that obviously but i think that 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 time is coming too that they're going to have to find more creative ways to get the content to everybody in a timely fashion yeah wow well i know you'll be a part of it and in our own way so will we because we're we're consumers but also you know one of the responsibilities i think from this show and and all your initiatives is to inspire the next generation to to make them love it as much as we do uh yeah we we jay was funny you know when we were jay leno was funny when we were at the ordrain thing as you know that 30 under 30 category that they had there was was genius because that's what i judged that's what you judge right and and that's all part of that's all part of this oddly enough our generation driving the younger one and guiding them. We, we have to continue to inspire um, younger generations to care because you guys know from going to, you know, Pebble and Andre and all these shows and Amelia for years, the, that, that older male audience is not going to be around forever. And if you don't get uh, women and young people and people of color and all shapes, walks of life to care about cars to some capacity, what we love, you know, is just not the same. It's important to bring that generation up and that's finding that emotional connection, right? I think that's why the movie Cars worked for so many kids is they made an emotional connection. Um, I, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but when the movie Cars came out, I went to the Peterson Automotive Museum and I did a talk on the art of cars. Oh yeah, there you go. Judging yeah. the uh, the BMW yeah. that, that I think that, I think one, that car that won. One, yep. yeah. And um, this guy came up to me after I did the talk about cars and he said, he had t- literally the guy had tears in his eyes and he said, I've seen cars couple hundred times now this is not very long after the movie came out i was like okay and um he said i have a and going back to hudson again he said i have a hudson hornet and my grandkids never cared about the car didn't want anything to do with it and after that movie they asked me every weekend they'd come over and say can we go in the car can we go in the car and he it 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 changed his relationship with his grandkids yeah i mean that's pretty cool it is Especially cool. Doing- I, it was a question I wanted to ask is, what is it about cars? We did, actually did a documentary, which you haven't seen because it hasn't been released, about, you know, there's, there's us that are car people. Like, we live for them. But Donald Osborne said everybody has a car story, even if it was, oh, my God, I can't believe we used to drive around in your gremlin. Or, you know, and, and it, it really broadens. Everyone has a story about a first date a road trip, but this, what is it about cars that, that make is such a big deal for people? It, it depends on where you're from. I found this globally that cars means different things to different people around the world. Huh. You know, that's, what's interesting is in, in China where a generation ago, they had no cars. It means something totally different to them. Huh. But to talk about Americans for a moment, the car has been such an important part of life here. Now in the UK where, where Derek might be from, like, you know, a, a car means a lot. British people love cars, but in the US, we are so spread out. We're so huge that, 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 that I mean, when, when, when Justin was a kid, you, by the time Justin was a kid, like more people had cars in the UK. When his dad, Derek was in the UK, less people. It, it grew because you needed cars. You got further and further away from the town centers. In the US, even more so because of what Henry Ford started with the Model T, you could move farther out of the town. And so, in the U.S., the car always was freedom to live or be or go where you wanted to go or where you wanted to be. That's what the automobile was, freedom, huh. um, regardless. And then also just a freedom of expression for who you are. You can have some identity through your car as well. Fantastic. Well, so interesting. we can't say it. We, we can't round off on a better note than that. So, Jay, thank you so much for, for doing two, one, 
virtual and one almost and one real interview in two days with us. Um, I can't wait to see you for real at an event coming soon, I hope. Who I knows? hope so too. Um, and good luck with everything. Thanks for being on Thank the show. Thank you, guys. It was great talking to you. Great seeing you. And uh, yeah, look forward to the next time we're actually sitting in cars together somewhere fun. So do I. Take care. Cool. Thank you. Bye, Jay. Bye, guys. What a guy, huh? Yeah, but he knows his stuff. Yeah, but it, it, thoughtful and, and doesn't just, you know, really like yeah. I was expecting. He says, well, it's different depending on where you're and something yeah. I never would have thought of because yeah. uh, whole American world. centric. Really very Impressive. What a what a fabulous show. Uh, we made, thank goodness, these two very important people were businessmen and car lovers were able to take time for the second day in a row, uh, which, as I said at the top of the show, wouldn't have happened had we uh, had we not been in our lockdown. So there's some ups and downs to this, uh, some upsides definitely for us. Thanks for watching. This was episode seven. Next week is our final episode of this first series of Lover Cars. We have Alan McNeish joining us because this weekend is the Le Mans 24 hours. And normally on a Tuesday, Alan will be going home with a trophy. He did that quite a few times. So he's joining us from Monaco, which will be rather fun. And fingers crossed we have a major celebrity to share with you uh, next week. So we're excited about that. Follow along on social media, obviously. Go to the Haggerty website, check into DriveShare, promise everyone will like it, right, Tommy? If they like cars. If they like cars. Otherwise, you won't be watching us. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Take care.